I, I did argue at the beginning of last year that we're in a recession, but I argue that it's a rolling recession affecting different industries, sectors at different times without adding up to an economy-wide recession. So uh, I was not in the recession camp last year, nor this year, and I don't think we're gonna have a recession in uh, 2024 either. Welcome back to Soar Financially. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us here on this channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And I'm really, really excited for this upcoming discussion here today. Uh, we have Ed Yardini joining us. He's the president of Yardini Research. And if you've been following mainstream media, you might have heard his name the last 24 hours quite often because he made a very bullish call on the S&P 500. He predicted a, a target price of 6000 uh, by the end of 2025, and the market is in an uproar. They're excited because there are lots of pessimists in the markets, and we've interviewed a lot here on this channel as well. So it's going to be a really refreshing discussion, actually because I'm looking forward to discussing market opportunities with an optimist. Because coming from the gold space, we're always pessimistic. We always look for the negative, of course. And I'm German, so it's not a, not a good combination. And uh, before I switch over to my guest, one quick ask, that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot bringing guests like Ed on the program because we really, really appreciate his time because I know it's tight and he's in high demand right now. So really appreciate that. Ed, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much sure. for joining us. It's good my to pleasure. see you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, let, let's dive right in. It like really, you you made a really really bold call. Uh, the market and uh, or the every single news outlet picked it up because it's quite contrary to what everybody else on the street right. believes is going to happen. Uh, l let's start with that. Let, let's start a like. What, what's the reason for your very bold uh, S and P five hundred call? Well, I don't expect a recession. I, I I did argue at the beginning of last year that we're in a recession, but I argue that it's a rolling recession affecting different industries, sectors at different times without adding up to an economy-wide recession. So uh, I was not in the recession camp last year, nor this year, and I don't think we're going to have a recession in uh, 2024 either. I think inflation's turning out to be uh, transitory after all, not as persistent as many, as many feared. Uh, I, I think to a large extent, economists uh, kind of uh, ignored the shock effects and the aftershocks of the pandemic. And uh, there were a lot of very inflationary effects that uh, have been abating, have been dissipating uh, over the past year. And uh, I think inflation is going to be down to 2% by the end of next year, which is where the Fed wants to have it. So I expect that the Fed will lower interest rates, not by four or more, uh, not four or more times, but two times, uh, because I don't think they're going to have to lower rates because of a recession, but simply because they don't want to maintain a, an even more restrictive policy by keeping interest rates where they are as inflation moderates. So I am optimistic on the earnings outlook. Uh, I've been arguing that uh, the decade ahead is going to wind up looking more like the roaring 2020s uh, than a repeat of the 1970s. Interesting. I think I might have stolen the term rolling recession from you because I've been using it on the podcast here quite a bit. Yeah, I, well. I mentioned it. Uh, I first started talking about it in 1985. I've been doing this for a while, so I've I've seen a few things. and. Uh, the current environment reminded me of the, what happened in 85 when we had a plunge in oil prices on the oil patch went into a recession. Let, let's actually dive a little deeper on that topic, like the rolling recession versus a real recession. Because when people talk about recession, they see people jumping out of windows, sadly. <laughs> like there, there's fires in the street. Right. People are getting laid off left, right, and center. Um, but a rolling recession is quite different because we're experiencing yes. it right now. Can you describe the difference a little bit and how is it affecting people differently? Well, it's fairly straightforward to just observe it. Uh, we've seen that at the beginning of last year, because of the initial jump in mortgage rates, uh, housing activity uh, went into a recession. But let's be very specific. It was single family housing that went into a recession. Multifamily still held up very well because uh, there's just a tremendous demand for rental properties, especially down uh, in areas where people have been moving to uh, where the sun shines uh, more than it does up north. So there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a boom in multifamily construction. Uh, then uh, coming out of the pandemic lockdowns in uh, March and April of 2020, a lot of people got cabin fever, kind of stuck at home and uh, saved uh, a couple of bucks uh, during the uh, two months of the lockdown. And then the government uh, provided helicopter money added 
lots of money to people's uh, deposit accounts three times in a row as uh, pandemic uh, relief checks. And so there's a lot of cash around. And uh, when people got out of uh, out of the lockdowns, they had cabin fever and they wanted to go spending. I mean, the best way to get over uh, feeling bad is to go shopping for a lot of people. And certainly Americans are like that, uh, as are others. And uh, then so we saw a tremendous demand for goods and services, but the services were still kind of locked down uh, by uh, social distancing restrictions. So we had a buying binge in goods, uh, which then turned into a recession in that sector because retailers ordered too much. It got stuck in the LA ports and in the transportation system. By the time it arrived at the retailers in uh, 2021, late 2021, uh, consumers have said, no mas, we don't want any more. Uh, we're, we're going traveling now. We're going to hotels and motels and uh, we're going to restaurants. So the whole thing changed. Uh, meanwhile, the overall economy continued to do well because consumers did continue to spend. They spent uh, increasingly on services. And even in the uh, area that's uh, in a commercial, in a real estate recession right now, a commercial real estate, I should say, uh, most of that is uh, in old downtown office buildings. Uh, state of the art, modern office buildings are doing fine. Uh, overall, malls are still uh, doing business. Consumers uh, are shopping. So it's it's been rolling. Now I think we're going to have a rolling recovery in, in goods, for example, uh, and in housing because interest rates are coming down. And so you put it all together and you just don't get that, that famous gray shade around a recession on charts showing when things turn down. And recessions don't last very long anyways. And uh, uh, bear markets uh, usually don't last uh, all that long. And I, I think so far this has been a Godot recession. It just <laughs> just won't show up. Everybody's been waiting for it, but just does not come. No. Nope. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, the the helicopter money or the, the, the SERP, you know, spending as well. I'm looking at, uh, you know, the S&P 500 cruise liners have been doing extremely well. Um, right. You know, in the S&P, I think uh, Royal Caribbean is ranked third here in the overall year performance. But I'm looking at the liquidity uh, as well. I think, you know, consumer savings being drained right now. Yeah. Do you, do you see that uh, that trend changing at all? Like, and what could change yeah. it? Well, I've I've been a contrarian on, on that issue as well because uh, the pessimists have basically been saying that the only reason we're not in a recession is because of all this excess savings that was accumulated during that pandemic. And uh, somebody as well connected and plugged into the economy as Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, since last since May of last year, has been saying that right now things are okay, but we're going to go into a recession because consumers are going to run out of their excess savings. Well, uh, presumably they've run out of those excess savings or they're about to. Uh, so far, we haven't had a consumer-led retrenchment and, and recession. Uh, what people uh, really fail to uh, recognize is that's not the only thing going on in our economy with regards to the consumer. Uh, there's a lot of people my age, baby boomers, who are retiring. I'm still working for a living, but a lot of my friends are retiring. And uh, they're asking themselves, well, you know, during the pandemic, they were, when they were in lockdown, uh, they had some time to think about the meaning of life. And many of them concluded, you know what, the meaning of life, life is too short. It's time to stop working. We're at the retirement age. Let's retire, you know, in our late 60s, uh, early 70s. And let's go travel. Let's go to restaurants. Let's have some fun. Um, and they realized that uh, all these years they've been saving uh, either in uh, oh, uh deposits or the stock market, their real estate's worth more. And so they got to the point in their lives where they said, this is where we stop saving and we start spending the money that we've accumulated uh, for retirement. So I think there's a lot of that going on. You know, uh, American households have $155 trillion in net worth, all time record high, $155 trillion. There's never been this much wealth in our country ever. And half of that is held by baby boomers who are retiring or starting to retire. And they have a tremendous amount of so-called excess savings, uh, way in excess, like $70 trillion uh, that the, the uh, so-called excess savings accumulated at the pandemic is pocket change compared to that. Absolutely. So you're actually not too worried about, uh, you know, excess, no. like the savings, the level of savings dropping quite a bit. As well. no. Interesting. Not... Oh, yeah. Interesting. Um, your your colleague and uh, economist uh, Paul Krugman said the war on inflation is over. We we won, uh, but he left out really critical components in in his statement: food, energy, 
uh, housing and things yeah. as well. So I'm curious, like, because you're saying, okay, we're going to get back to 2% as well. Yeah. How does the whole onshoring topic sort of fit in? And uh, what, what do you yeah. base your assumption on? Well, first of all, with regards to inflation, I mean, clearly, uh, we've had a lot of inflation over a very short period of time, the past couple of years. And so uh, people go into the grocery stores and uh, they, they look at their rent, rent and uh, they, they, they say that, you know, prices are up. They never, they're not coming down. Uh, but inflation is the year over year percent change in prices and it can come down to zero, but uh, we're still going to have the high prices that accumulated uh, during uh, the inflation that we've had in the past couple of years. Uh, what uh, people don't uh, seem to recognize is they've got some money illusion because they don't realize uh, many of them that wages uh, went up uh, about as, as fast as prices in a lot of instances. That's not universally true. Uh, but the fact is uh, we had sort of had stagnant real wages, inflation adjusted wages uh, for the past couple of years. Now we're starting to see the wages are rising faster than, than prices. Uh, with regards to onshoring, we've got an onshoring boom in the U.S., uh, particularly in the construction of manufacturing facilities. Uh, that data has just gone vertical straight up. I think it's up something like 60, 70 percent on a year over year basis. Uh, so there's a lot of manufacturing facilities being built uh, for our, uh, EV plants, uh, electric vehicle batteries, uh, for uh, semiconductors. Um, and uh, that's all good for the U.S. economy is another reason to believe that uh, the economy is resilient. And while there's pockets of weakness, uh, this rolling recession ID, there's also pockets of strength. Absolutely. Yeah. Like one thing, like I interviewed Darius Dale here, uh, I think a month or so ago as well. And uh, he mentioned income growth is a factor, an indicator people don't usually look at when they make their forecasts, like when they call for a recession next year uh, and, and look at inflation as well. So income growth, I think, is really, really important. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's real wages. So it's definitely wages divided by prices. And uh, that's been a, an area of stagnation. So the excess savings did help to keep the economy growing. In, in in the past couple of years, but now we, the labor market remains strong enough that uh, there's still plenty of companies looking for employees. And so employment's increasing. It's hard to have a recession uh, without uh, job losses. And that's just not the case right now. Is there like a jobless uh, number that makes you nervous or would, uh, you know, let you rethink some of your uh, yeah. pred predictions? Like I had a guest on yesterday. He said, well, 4% people start to take notice. I'm in Germany. We're sitting at four point eight, uh, sorry, five point eight, five point nine percent, and nobody really cares. Yeah. It, well, that's right. I mean, uh, it, it it wasn't too long ago that people thought that uh, full employment uh, could be defined as unemployment getting down to four to five percent, and that uh, that unemployment was basically frictional. People looking for jobs, not finding them right away, and so uh, in Germany, in Europe, uh, in the United States, four to five percent was viewed as a pretty good rate to get down to. Uh, now we're below 4% in the United States. And uh, I, I don't think uh, that, that if, if the statistic got up to 4 to 5%, that that would freak out the consumer. Uh, as long as they have jobs uh, and income, they're going to be uh, spending uh, the way the way I see it. Um, but uh, obviously, economists will be getting panicky and say, oh, my God, we, we're back up above 4%. Uh, it looks like we're heading towards 5%. And uh, we're, we're, we're about to fall into recession. So, you know, economists tend to be a pessimistic lot, I guess. Uh, and uh, it's interesting just how much pessimism there's been around for the past couple of years, but that's, it's logical. I mean, the Fed raises interest rates by 500 basis points and it's logical to expect a recession. Uh, but, uh, you know, you also have to be open-minded and look around at the data and let the data kind of guide you. And the data has been telling me that uh, we're not having a recession, that the economy is resilient. The other thing it's telling me is that, yeah, the Fed's uh, tightened a great deal, uh, but maybe what it's also done is it's normalized. We're, we've kind of back to normal interest rates. Isn't that kind of refreshing? It, we, we, we lived with interest rates at this level without any problems before the great financial crisis. So the real abnormality isn't what's going on now. We're back to normal. The abnormality was what happened between the great financial crisis and the great virus crisis when central banks had this obsession and fear of deflation and desperately try to get inflation back to 2% uh, with ultra easy monetary policy. That, that whole period uh, was abnormal.
Uh, absolutely. You, you mentioned the Fed. I think we need to drill down on the role of the Fed a little bit more as well. You mentioned, or are you predicting two, two rate cuts next next year? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I want to follow up with that as well. Do you think that the Fed has generated enough of a buffer, even if things were to break, to have enough um, you know leeway to sort of uh, catch a falling night or uh, what, what's the right term for that, to sort of yeah. slow down momentum of a crash potentially? Well, look, uh, we had a mini banking crisis, uh, very many uh, back in March of, of this year, three banks folded. Uh, the Fed, within a couple of days, came up with a liquidity facility for the banks, and that immediately stabilized the situations. The, the Fed has a lot of experience in playing. I don't know if you have this. In, in, yeah, I'm sure you have it in Europe. The, uh, the, the whack-a-mole game, you know, where <laughs> these moles jump out of the holes and you, you hit them with a hammer to try to get them back down. Uh, the Fed has a lot of experience playing whack-a-mole uh, with crises uh, during the uh, great financial crisis and during the great virus crisis. And they, were, you know, overnight can come up with these liquidity facilities that seem to calm everybody's nerves down. Look, uh, in the past, traditionally, the way that things worked is um, we'd have a, a business cycle boom. Uh, the Fed would uh, recognize the inflationary consequences of that uh, a bit late. Uh, they would uh, scramble to uh, get uh, ahead of the inflation curve, uh, the yield curve inverted, implying that bond investors are saying, if the Fed keeps tightening, something's going to break. So let's buy bonds here, even though their their yield is lower than a two-year. Uh, and sure enough, something breaks that uh, in the financial system. That turns into a credit crunch, and that's what caused recessions. Uh, this time around, the Fed's tightened. Uh, we had something break in the financial system, but it did not lead to an economy-wide credit crunch. And so far, we haven't had an economy-wide uh, recession. We've had some speculative uh, bubbles uh, burst in the meme stocks, in the SPACs, and some other areas. I would argue that uh, there was kind of a forced speculative bubble in bonds. People actually bought bonds in the United States at 0.5% a couple of few years ago, and they got, uh, they, they got hurt really badly. Uh, but here we are, even though that speculative bubble has burst, Again, it was sort of engineered. It was forced on us by the Fed, even though that's burst. Uh, we're just not seeing the dire consequences that people have been anticipating. I want to drill down a bit deeper on your on your uh, S and P five hundred call here of six thousand, and uh, we've we've seen the magnificent seven obviously lead the index. Uh, cruise liners did really really well as well, of course. Uh, yeah. But who do you think is going to carry the market now moving forward for the next two years? Is that going yeah. to change? Is it going to be technology companies still? Because we discussed sort of a spending of of sure. the consumer, which might slow down. So cruise liners might not be leading it, in my opinion. But uh, do you do you see any other sectors picking up the slack then? Well, uh, look uh, the. The bears, the pessimists have been arguing that uh, this is not a real bull market. Uh, I've been arguing since the beginning of November of last year that uh, we bottomed on October uh, 12th and that that was uh, the beginning of a, of a new bull market and that the previous bear market was fairly conventional. 25% decline didn't really last that long and uh, it didn't uh, persist because we didn't have a recession. Um, but the bears and the pessimists are saying, well, the, the bull market now really isn't legitimate because it's uh, very narrow. It's only a, a handful of stocks, the Magnificent Seven, as you say. So it's narrow, it's not broad, and uh, that's just not going to be sustainable. Uh, well, why can't it broaden out uh, if, the, if we're not going to have a recession after all? If the Fed's done raising interest rates and might actually be lowering interest rates somewhat, if inflation continues to moderate as, as it has been, uh, all of these ifs are not uh, hypothetical. You know, we're we're on the on the trends in those directions, and so if if all that's the way things are, are shaping up, why couldn't the the market broaden out? Uh, I think technology still is going to be the the leadership group, and the, I I wouldn't uh, rule out the possibility that the Magnificent Seven continue to outperform, but I think they'll at least perform as well as the market. Uh, but technology uh, sector can broaden out. A lot more stocks could participate uh, there. Uh, I like the financials. I like the industrials. I think uh, those stocks uh, could also uh, uh, help to lead the market uh, still higher. I even like energy. It hasn't. That's been my my one clunker. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the the earnings yield is quite good in, in that uh, sector, and I think uh, the companies have gotten the message that uh, that we're we're working on a, on a transition to a, a a cleaner future from fossil 
Uh, and so the fossil companies have been able to cut back on their capital spending. Meanwhile, uh, energy prices remain relatively high. I mean, a lot lower than they had been, but certainly enough to make th those those companies profitable. So I, I, I don't really don't really understand why people would be making uh, the argument that uh, the the narrowness 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 of the market uh, definitely implies that it's uh, going to go back down. Do you, do you foresee any turbulence in the near future at all? Like a six thousand call is what is that twenty five percent from now? Almost thirty. Well, yeah, look, uh, I, I I pay attention to what the bears have been saying. They saved me a lot of work. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if, if they weren't around, I'd have to think about everything that could go wrong, and then think about what could go right, and then come up with an opinion. Uh, they do such great work on everything that could blow up uh, that they save me a lot of time, and uh, then I spend a lot of my time trying to be balanced and say, well, what's wrong with their argument? Where what what might they be missing, and what could actually go go right? I mean, they never talk about things like productivity possibly being uh, b better than expected. They never talk about net worth being at an all-time record high. They see debt as all negative. They don't appreciate that uh, if somebody buys uh, the government auction, that's somebody's wealth that just went up. So it, the, the, there's sort of a balance there. I, I do think that there's a potential for a debt crisis. I know Ray, Ray Dalio has been scaring people with the idea that uh, – Fiscal policy is out of control in the U.S., and I think he's absolutely right. It's it is out of control, uh, but inflation's been coming down, and uh, at five percent, uh, we we uh, on the ten-year bond, we found a lot of buyers there. Uh, everybody knows that fiscal policy is out of control, uh, but uh, if we have better than expected growth, that could help to uh, ease the pressure from that debt crisis. And meanwhile, it's a man and woman-made problem. We all know that. Uh, fiscal policy can be fixed very easily. Uh, in theory, uh, all we have to do is cut outlays and increase uh, uh, revenues. In practice, the political part partners partisanship is uh, not going to let it happen, certainly not between now and the elections of next year. Investors realize that nothing good is going to happen on dealing with the deficit between now and then and next year. And that could very well come back to haunt us as a problem uh, for uh, 2025. Uh, Hopefully we'll do another discussion like this and we can update things and say, you know, if, if, if things sort of panned out for what I call the roaring 2020s or if we tripped up on the debt issue or as inflation suddenly made a surprising uh, comeback or some of the geopolitical issues come to the fore. By the way, speaking of geopolitics, I just want to make one quick point, and that is uh, in the U.S. we tend to be very U.S. centric. And the reality is the notion that we have to have a recession in order to bring inflation down uh, doesn't recognize the fact that the Chinese and the Europeans have done us a big favor. They have had a recession. Uh, China is in a property deflation bigger than what the U.S. experienced uh, in the, the great financial crisis, bigger than what Japan had in the late 1980s. So they're having a recession, if not a depression. That their prices are deflating and they're exporting that deflation to us. So we don't have to have a recession uh, to bring goods inflation down. And Europeans are in a shallow recession now. They'll come out of it as the ECB uh, eases. Uh, but all in all, the U.S. has actually been a beneficiary of the weakness in the global economy while maintaining its resilience and relative strength. And I could talk with you for hours, but I have a couple last last questions here. Uh, we, I promise you, we have, we have to talk about commodities. Uh, you, sure. you touched on energy, but I want to drill down more on the the precious metals and the base metals. Yeah. Um, given given your five or six thousand point call for the S and P five hundred, what, what what will the commodities do in your opinion? Well, uh, I view commodities as a very important indicator for my work. Uh, it's available. The data is available uh, daily. I'm a big fan of what's called the CRB. Uh, industrial spot price index. It includes 13 raw industrial commodity prices. Uh, some of them are traded in futures markets. A lot of them are not. So they kind of reflect uh, the reality of supply and demand in the global economy. It does not include uh, energy. It does not include oil. So uh, I like it for that reason, because I like to look at energy separately, because it's got its own demand supply um, uh, variables uh, that, that are critically important. Uh, right now, commodity prices are depressed. Um, I, I guess the next thing they should do is is go up, but uh, I think China is going to remain depressed. So I think that keeps the lid on uh, industrial commodity prices, particularly uh, things like uh, uh, copper. Uh, 
uh, raw materials generally that are used uh, for uh, spending on infrastructure and and certainly on housing. They're not going to be buying much copper uh, for uh, you know for for bathrooms and and things like that. Um, the oil uh, market, uh, I think we're starting to see that uh, there is a uh, th th there there is a, a more rapidly reacting consumer of gasoline. When the gasoline price goes up, consumers really do cut back pretty pretty rapidly here. So I, I think OPEC, the Saudis, certainly the Russians, uh, really wanted to see the price go up to 100 and stay there for a while. I don't think they wanted 120 or 150 because I think that they recognize that would be uh, counterproductive because that would cause a global recession. So they wanted a really high price, high enough price without causing a recession. And uh, the global economy consumer responded by saying, no, 100 doesn't work for us. 90 doesn't work for us. And I think it's more like 80 uh, if they're lucky. Um, and, uh, you know, with the transition to electric vehicles uh, 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 likely to continue, I think uh, we're going to settle down at uh, basically current prices. So I, I don't really see much upside in uh, commodity prices, generally speaking. Uh, with regards to precious metals, um, I'm no expert there. So uh, there, there's plenty of people more, <laughs> more more educated in that area. But I, I think gold has tended to be a, an indicator of the underlying trend in commodity prices. And if I'm right, the commodity prices aren't going to go uh, um, um, anywhere special, then uh, uh, gold may uh, also stabilize, even though it's recently hit, hit a, a uh, record high. Fantastic. Ed, phenomenal insights. Like one topic we haven't talked about is the bond market. You touched on it briefly, but uh, it's such a broad topic, like big bond auction happening this week as well. We'll cover that next time. And uh, I My really, pleasure. really, really appreciate your time. Let's, uh, our viewers, where can we find more of you? Your dannyquicktakes.com, yeah. I think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we, we have created a, a, a research service for individual investors. Uh, it's, it's uh, I, th I think you'll find it uh, reasonably priced and reasonably uh, useful. It uh, basically shows you the relationship between the economic indicators of the markets and tries to anticipate that. We've had a pretty good uh, set of calls over the past couple of years with it. So yeah, it's www.yardeni, Y-A-R-D-E-N-I, quicktakes.com, all, all one word. Fantastic. We'll definitely link to it down below as well. And truly appreciate your time, Ed. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank and, you, And uh, we hope to do this again very, very soon. Thank you, Kay. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. I tremendously enjoyed it. It's, it's refreshing to talk to an optimist as well, because I think a lot of us missed some opportunities in the main markets as we were expecting a recession already for this year, and we shied away from putting money to work. So let's let's see how that changes. Let's uh, let's follow these trends. Let's be a bit more optimistic. Coming from the gold side, of course, we do want to see you know a blow off top. We want to see gold run to three thousand, four thousand, whatever the target may be. But uh, let, let's be a bit more realistic. And I really appreciate Ed's take here. Um, there are some underlying positive developments in in the economies uh, worldwide, not just in the U.S. and uh, it's, it's good to point those out. So really appreciate that. Thanks so much for tuning in. Leave a comment. What do you think is happening? Is the U.S. really going to hit a recession? Is it going to be a soft landing, hard landing, no landing? You Put that down below. We want to hear from you. And uh, please hit that subscribe button. Really appreciate it so we can bring quality guests like Ed back on the program more regularly. Thank you so much. And we'll be back with lots more.